Hey guys, welcome back to episode 5 of Obsolete. I'm Famicom Man, and uh, it's just back to me again today. No more guest segments or anything. And um, got a pretty interesting show for you today. I'm actually trying to do two cameras, which uh, is pretty cool. I picked up a uh, compact VHS camera for about 15 bucks, and as far as I know, it works pretty well. And uh, I'm going to be trying to work in two cameras. So hopefully you'll be seeing some of that. I haven't checked the tape on it yet, so hopefully everything didn't, you know, go to waste and you'll be able to see two camera angles. And um, I'm also experimenting again with some lighting. And if you think it's hard to do lighting for one camera, two cameras don't even, it's just crazy. But um, without wasting any more time, I'm going to go into the first segment, which is VHS Basics. Alright, so... As you see in front of you, there's a VCR, and I'm going to be talking about VCRs and VHS. And some of you may wonder, you know, why even talk about this? Doesn't everybody know what a VCR is? And um, like thinking back to myself, I think that DVDs came out when I was like six or seven years old. And I'm sure that there's people that watch this that are a lot younger than I am, and they may not even know, you know, what VHS is, what a VCR is, how it works. And um, I'm planning on doing a lot more VHS-oriented segments, showing, showing off some of the oddities and some of the weird stuff and how to copy everything over to digital, how to deal with macro vision, stuff like that. And uh, so I thought I'd do a quick, like, primer segment on VHS before I go into anything, you know, regarding oddities or whatever, so people know what is standard. And... Um, VHS stands for Vertical Helical Scan, and um, it's a magnetic tape format that was introduced by JVC in 1976, and um, what a lot of people don't realize is that VHS won, but not only over Betamax. Um, I touched on the Betamax war before, where VHS and Betamax were basically going tit for tat, trying to outdo each other to become standard, but you know, people don't realize that there was a ton of other formats. Like, there was the Sony U-Matic, there was the Video 2000, which I believe was done by Philips. There's there's a ton of formats. Everybody and their sister came out with a different type of, like, home recording format. And uh, VHS won, beat them all, so that was pretty cool. Um, as for the actual specs for VHS, it has uh, 3 megahertz of video bandwidth. And you have your Chroma and your Luma. And uh, for audio, it started out as a single linear track, and then it went on to stereo linear, and then Hi-Fi came out about 1985 to, uh, you know, go against Beta, because they came out with their Beta Hi-Fi, and uh, Hi-Fi is CD quality, and what's interesting is that when it was first marketed, um, it was put into, like, home recording VCRs, and... VCR stands for Video Cassette Recorder, and some of the earlier ones, I believe, only had play functionality. But um, with the whole advent of you know recording stuff at home, the idea was that you would take like your radio and hook it up to your VCR when whenever they were doing some sort of like concert, and you wanted to record that so you could get the audio from your radio in hi-fi and then dub it in with the video. So that's probably kind of like a cool thing to do. I don't know if anybody actually ever did that, but who knows. And then um, with VHS, there was a number of improvements. Um, Super VHS came in to replace it in 1987. Um, it never really caught on as a consumer format because, you know, VHS was everywhere and nobody wanted to upgrade to go to Super VHS when it was only a little bit of improvement. Um, there was also VHS-C, which is compact VHS, came in 1982 for um, handheld recorders. And um, there was WVHS, which is digital VHS, came out in 1989. And this was for Muse recordings, if you guys remember me talking about laser discs. There was Muse, which was basically like the high-def television of the 80s. And then there was also Digital S, which is also known as D9 for professional use, which came out in 1995, used limitedly for TV stations. Um, some cool stuff is that there's 
some actual computer data backup for use with VHS, um, which was done mainly in uh, Russia. And Hila Packard tried to do something with it, but then they just got rid of it because of DAT tapes. Um, VHS is split up into three different regions, uh, CCAM, PAL, and TSC. And you need a special player to play each kind of tape, but they're all multi-system players which you can just throw any tape at them and it'll play them but for the most part you don't find those around very often and um... the VCR has pretty much been replaced it's pretty much the outcast of the video world now um... you know for the home recording capabilities DVRs came out around I don't know ten years ago or so and they've been really cutting into VHS at first you know I don't really think it was anything that you'd right away with. I mean, VHS still had the advantage of, you know, you could record onto tapes, you could keep the tapes, you could take the tape out and move it from room to room, whereas the first DVRs, you know, they had limited storage, and you couldn't go from room to room, but now with everything, if you have more DVRs, they can, you know, sync up with each other, there's huge hard drives, and stuff like that, and um, DVD basically replaced it as a consumer format in 1997. But the last big blockbuster movie on VHS came out in 2005. It was a history of violence. But um, there have been like small little videos coming out since then on VHS. Um, for example, in Japan, there's been a couple, and just more independent features. You can get them on VHS as well as DVD. Sometimes they package them together. And um, what's interesting is that VHS is still pretty popular. I mean, most of the tapes come out now are blank, but they're still making these tapes, and these tapes have been around forever and ever. And um, apparently Panasonic last year came up with plans for the first combination VHS Blu-ray player. I don't know if that's going to come out at all, but that would be kind of cool, kind of be a good homage to VHS. So now I'm going to show you uh, two players here. This is an older one. This is an RCA Selectivision VHS player, which is probably funny because you guys remember me talking about those big discs for Selectivision, but um, RCA actually rebranded or reused the name Selectivision for their VCR line, and um, this is a pretty standard VHS player right here. And you have your power button, you have a timer, so this one was obviously for you know recording purposes, not just playing stop play, rewind, fast forward, record you have your eject button, clock, and then you have all your presets for your stations and you can set the clock over here now I'm going to do a quick note about home recorders um, the first home recorders used four heads and that was to rival the two-headed uh, VCRs that just played and um, when the forehead models came out, a lot of people were kind of upset about this. I mean, of course, they were great for consumers because you could record, but um, for playing back just your commercial tapes, they actually shrunk the head size to fit more heads, so you'd have more control with the forehead models for recording. And the, the two heads that would normally play got a lot smaller, and a lot of people were kind of upset about the accuracy that these two heads would have. But um, nowadays, it really doesn't matter anymore. I mean, the technology is so cheap, you could probably get top of the line, you know, four heads and have perfect standard playback. And um, there's even some models, which I'll hopefully be showing you later. There's like six head models, eight head models. There's models with flying erase heads, self-cleaning heads, all kinds of good stuff. All right, so now here, you know, your standard T120 tape. And um, if you're wondering about the, the letters T, is for um, NTSC recordings, and I believe E is for PAL recordings. So you have your tape here, I mean, you just eject it. This is an old top loading model, these are the first to come out. You know, you put your tape in, push it down, then you hit play, and then it would play. I should probably have to do power, play, ah, there you go. Makes a nice grinding noise, which is always good. But, uh, just gonna stop that for right now. Now we're gonna move on.
Here's a newer VCR by Philips. It's their uh, Magnavox brand here. And this is a front loading VCR. It's a lot lighter than you know the old ones. It comes with a VCR Plus where you could actually at the time when this is available, I don't think it's around anymore. You could look up a code for your pro for your uh, TV show and it's a programming code and you could input it into your VCR just the code and it would know when and what channel to record if you want to make a recording. And uh, this is a four head model with hi-fi, which is good. You got your power, your VCR TV button, play, stop, rewind, fast forward, record. And uh, I'm going to go to the backs of these models. Um, so you can see you have stereo, audio, and video here. And then you have your antenna. Let's see, right here. So you have your output and your input. And then going back to the humongous old guy over here. You know, you don't have that. I mean, you have you have antenna for UHF, and you have your VHF stuff here, but this one lacks composite inputs and any RCA plugs of any type. And uh, there are some later models that have that, but this one doesn't seem to. And uh, that's it for VCRs, and uh, hopefully I'll be bringing you some more interesting stuff with VCRs in upcoming episodes. Hope you guys liked that segment. Um, as I said in the segment, I plan on doing a lot more uh, VHS oriented segments, maybe doing something on VHS style camcorders. Um, I talked about doing, you know, converting your tapes over to digital and dealing with macro vision, also stuff with, you know, video processors. Um, probably going to show off some editing decks. Um, VHS oddities like dual deck VCRs, uh, maybe even like automatic rewinders, uh, time lapse VCRs. There's just a ton of stuff I can do with that. And um, now get ready for the next segment, which is payphone anatomy. So, right here is a ProTel payphone. Now, payphones first came out in about 1889. And uh, they were really popular. I believe the first one was in a bank in Connecticut. And um, by 1960, there were a million Bell payphones in the United States. And um, in 1981, that number got even bigger because independent stores started selling payphones. And by 2000, there were over 2 million payphones in the United States. However, uh, more recently, that number has dropped to about 700,000, mostly around uh, 2007, 2008, because uh, a lot of the phone companies are starting to get rid of them. They don't want them anymore. They're too expensive to maintain. And so most people would basically say that the payphone has died and that there isn't really a use for them anymore. I mean, cell phones came out, and everybody has a cell phone. And you know, telephone companies are making more money off of cell phones than off of pay phones, and you know, why keep both? So pay phones are starting to bite the dust. Now, something interested, interesting about um, with the 1981 independent sales, that opened up something called a COCOT, which is a customer-owned coin-operated telephone, and uh, that's what you see right in front of you. This is a uh, Protel pay phone. I believe. Um, it has a coin slot on the right, which is common with Cocots, although I believe some uh, phones branded with Verizon use them. Um, this is modeled off of a uh, Western Electric model, and um, I'm going to show you some of the innards of it today. Um, a lot of people know what a payphone looks like, but they might not know what the inside looks like. And um, before I get started here, I mean, um, it's your standard payphone. This one came out of a high school in uh, Upper Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, so if you went to high school in Mechanicsburg, you might have used this before. And um, so the front part actually comes off um, right here. 
there's a spot where you need a T key to open it. The T key is a special type of telephone key. It's in the shape of a T. And uh, I didn't have one. This one came already open. I actually have another payphone, which uh, is locked right now and needs a T key. So I'm going to order one of those soon. And uh, down here, this is where another lock would go. I believe it's called like a Medeco lock. And um, this one came already open. So I didn't need the lock. The other one, I actually drilled out the lock. And hopefully if I get the T key, it'll open. So um, basically the payphone with both parts weighs about, I don't know, maybe 60 pounds. Um, your front part is just, you know, the front face. Handset is connected to it. So you have your coin slot, your coin release, Get your buttons down here. And then here in the back, um, the phone, the handset is actually tethered in here using a thing of steel. And um, the handset on this, actually, I don't think it works. The, uh, the receiver part, I can't hear anything if I plug in another phone to the line. I can hear if I, if I talk into it using another phone, but if I talk into the other phone, I can't hear anything through this one. So I'm working on getting a replacement for that. So, I mean, back here, this connects into the main phone, which I'll be showing you in a minute. And, uh, we just go through here. You have this, uh, interesting sort of little circuit board here. And that's where you connect in the handset. This probably also interfaces with the uh, buttons out front. And so you can figure out, you know, if the phone's off the hook, stuff like that. Um, going over here again, it's where the handset comes in. Then down below, we really don't have anything. Up top, we really don't have anything except, I believe, the uh, coin release latch. And then moving this to the side. We have our main phone here, and um, up here, right here, this is the whole, you know, coin assembly that holds the coins, takes your coins. Um, then this board here on the left, as you can see, it says Protel. This is what I believe to be a Cocot board. So, um, if you're wondering what's the difference between a Cocot and you know a standard phone, internal wise. Um, your standard telephone company owned phone would have nothing inside, no sort of board that would regulate the coins. That would be all done, you know, back at the switching center or something over the line. Now with customer owned phones, they needed their own little board because they weren't relying on the telephone company for the charge and stuff. They had to set prices and stuff through their own, you know, little thing. And apparently you could even call into these boards or something and reset them. And uh, some of them have little like LCD or LED screens. This one's an older one, and I don't even know if it works or not. I don't know if it has any programming. Some of them, like you have to, for if you're buying like a refurbished board, and you have to program them. I don't know if this one was wiped or if this one has programming. I don't know what's the deal with it. When I got it, nothing was plugged in or anything. It was basically in pieces. And um, so... At the top here, this little port, this connects to the upper housing, which I showed that little uh, cable before. And then you have some programming buttons. I don't know what this does. I'm not a phone expert here. You have your trigger switch, which is for the coins, I believe. Your battery. These things have batteries in them. The other here is 1997, so this is pretty old. And then a uh, telephone line connects to the telephone line. I'll show you some of that later. There's ground. There's, there's a bunch of stuff here. There's even stuff that doesn't even look like it's plugged in. I'm not sure where it goes. But down here, this is where you have this this part on the right plugs in to the Protel board. And then on the left, over here, that's what plugs into the wall. So this is basically where all your circuits are connected from. Now, um, over here, this thing that says warning, do not push, 
that's actually, I believe, the coin return mechanism. Because I had a friend that just, like, hit it back, and then a dime popped out. I didn't even know it was in there. So, because if you hit that, that's your coin return. And then, going back over here, this is your whole coin mechanism. This is also from 1997. And, uh, so that sorts between your nickels, dimes, quarters, everything. Um, on the lower part down here, this, uh, big blocky thing on the left here is where your coins are stored. And, you know, you need a key to get in there. I believe it's the same T key as the side, so... Who knows about that? And then your standard coin return slot right there on the right. And now I'm gonna rotate the housing for you a little bit. So you have another key slot right here, which I believe is also for the coin return. And then you have your back here. This would normally screw into a wall or a booth or something. So I don't believe that they would just set these down places. And then you need some sort of cord to come out the back so you could, you know, hook it up to a telephone line. I added this one in to test it. Then, you know, the side again, it's all smooth. And then if you want to connect, you know, the upper housing back, then you just Connect that up right there. And pick this up. And slide it right in. And then you're good. Alright, and that is a Kokot telephone. If I ever get this one or the other one working properly, I might show how you can put this up in your own house or something, use it as a standard phone. I mean, it's probably not going to work perfectly, but if anything, it'll look pretty cool. It'll have some sort of nostalgic feel to it, so hopefully I can get that going for you. And uh, that's it for this segment. Hope you guys liked that segment. Uh, hopefully I can get some of the keys and stuff I need so that I can do uh, replacements and trying to get my payphone and the other one operational. And of course I'll do a segment on that if I get the stuff that I need. And um, right now I'm going to try to do something new which is a review. Now, you might ask what I'm going to review. Um, I think right now I'm going to start trying to do like books or movies. But I mean like not every day, you know, your standard movies. Maybe like hacker documentaries or some IPTV show DVDs, stuff like that. Stuff that, you know, maybe a normal person you'd go and download it but you wouldn't actually see what comes with it or stuff like that. And um, it might be something current, like it might be like a pure ownage DVD set, but it could also be something old. Like I have a lot of really weird, kind of bizarre hacker books from the 80s and the 90s that I've read through, and some of those might make pretty good reviews. But uh, today I'm going to show Rice Tea, which is made by Julian McArdle. And um, this actually started back a while ago, maybe five years or so on uh, the Bindrev forums where he was planning on doing a movie called Hackers which was spelled lead speak to differentiate it between you know the 1995 classic we all love but um, for those who don't know Julian McArdle if you're into IPTV at all he did the Ento show which is basically just a one-time show that taught about computers and computer safety and stuff sort of like an instructional video you could show to a group of students or something and um, he also did the On Piracy documentary, which is a pretty cool documentary on piracy. You don't usually see this angle that he was trying to show. And um, so going back to the book, it started out as a movie, and uh, he'd been filming another movie, I believe it was Docs at the time, and he was kind of low on budget. He's also going to school, so he didn't have the necessary funds to complete this movie. So what he did was, uh, he changed the name to Rice Tea, and he released it as a book. Now, um, I actually found this book by just Googling myself, and um, he put me in the, I believe it's the special thanks section, and um, which I didn't even know I was there, just from you know communicating with him on the forums about the movie, and I thought that was pretty cool. And um, he releases the book free as a PDF download, but I went and I got the physical copy, which is published independently, by Lulu, 
and um, I think it's somewhere between like fifteen dollars and twenty dollars. It's just pretty good price, and uh, the book itself is about two hundred pages, and it's a great book if you're like just getting started in the hacker community or you're interested in the hacker community, or if you have a friend that's interested in the hacker community and about what hackers really do. Um, as you can probably tell by the original name, Hackers, this book is kind of based off of Hackers in a way. I'm not going to try to give away too much, but um, there's a group of friends who stumble onto a botnet and um, they're trying to bring it down and not get pinned with it themselves. And it, it borrows a lot from the movie Hackers. There's some lines in there which you can tell are just like he watched the movie and he put that in there like directly and there's a lot of scenes that correspond and it's a really cool read um, and if you're worried like what if I don't get the technical aspects of it he breaks everything down really well and anybody who's new to even computers can understand this book but anybody who's like a seasoned computer user they will also get some enjoyment out of this book it's, it's really cool and um, that is Rice Tea by Julian McArdle and what's actually cool is he is now turning it into a movie again, and it's called uh, Botnet, and I believe he finished up filming a little while ago, so hopefully we can see the movie soon. Alright, and that's my review for this episode. So I advise that you check that out. If anything, you know, download the PDF version, give it a quick skim through, but really I think it's great, and if anything, it probably deserves, you know, you to go out and purchase it if you really like it. And, um... Now switching gears over to the final segment, which is quadraphonics. So what I have here in front of you is a quadraphonic system. I can't exactly call it a stereo system because, you know, stereo has two channels and a quadraphonic has four. Uh, nowadays it's called the 4.0 surround sound. And um, the cool thing about quadraphonics is that you take the four speakers and you put them in different corners of the room and then you sit in the center of the room and that was the first surround sound and um, the downfalls of quadraphonics is that it lacked its own format it relied on a bunch of other stuff some of which you know was kind of flaky at times um, it was more expensive than a standard stereo and you had to pay for more speakers and there was a few recordings that were actually made using any sort of quadraphonic format, though uh, today some of them have been reissued as like a surround sound CDs, stuff like that. And um, quadraphonics was originally introduced in 1970 as the quad eight for eight tracks, but was soon, you know, used for vinyl and reel-to-reel -reel recordings. And um, it really failed with vinyl because there was two different ways that it was recorded onto vinyl. You could either have discrete channels which had four channels completely separated or you could have a matrix encoded two channels and then the the quadraphonic system itself would take the two tracks or two channels and split it up into four and um, this gave it some backwards compatibility with uh, standard stereo turntables but if you had the discrete ones you couldn't use those on regular turntables at all you had to have your quadraphonic system and um, so besides, you know, using 8-tracks and reel-to-reel -reel and vinyl, there was actually some radio stations that did quadraphonic audio. And um, they didn't really last that much. I think uh, BBC had one for a little while. There was one in California. And um, they were actually composed of two standard radio stations. And uh, you could go on your standard stereo radio and just pick up both stations, they're probably a little bit apart from each other. So, uh, there was two standards that were adopted for vinyl, which was the CD4, also known as the Quadradisc standard, and um, this behaved like a stereo which had a carrier signal, so you had the stereo tracks, and then the carrier signal was then taken in by the uh, demodulator and that split it up into four different tracks and um, for the four tracks there was like a uh, left back and left forward came out of the left track and then the right back and the right forward came out of the right track so you broke the two tracks into four tracks 
And um, to use this, you needed a, a CD4 cartridge, a CD4 demodulator, and a four channel amplifier. So you had to have all of this. And um, usually the demodulator and the amplifier were built into each other. But for the CD4 cartridge, you had to have that separately. And um, there was also another format for vinyl called Stereo Quadraphonic, which made use of the matrix encoded format. But that wasn't as popular. And um, basically, the whole format failed because of the vinyl problem. And they didn't really last that long. I think the last, what was it, the last 8 track that made use of Quadraphonic came out in 1978 or something. So this wasn't even around a whole decade. But I mean, it's a pretty cool system, and I'll show off what I have here in front of me. This is a Sony four channel stereo music system. Um, this is actually probably the coolest part right here in the corner where you have the listening position display. And um, basically, you could, after you put the speakers in the four corners of the room, you could change up everything, like fine tune it to where you were in the room. And you have your power switch, headphone jack, going over here, volume, bass, treble. And you have your, your AM FM tuner with all kinds of options here. And then down here, you know, you have your discrete, your square, all this interesting quadraphonic stuff, monitor modes, phono, AM FM tuner here. And up here is the turntable. This up here. And um, this is actually a pretty standard turntable made by Sony. Um, this particular turntable in this quadraphonic system is broken. Uh, the motor isn't turning anything anymore. And I actually have another turntable that is the same brand and like the same model number as this one which I'm trying to switch out but to no success yet and um, basically if you just take the cartridge off of this and put it on the other one it should work as a quadraphonic turntable I can't see any reason why it wouldn't I mean um, the audio going in to the system is in stereo so it, it's, as long as it's not you know, like a four channel turntable already where the demodulator is built into the turntable I think this you know switch could go pretty easy. So now I'm going to show you the back of the unit. All right, so down there over here we have the antennas, FM, AM, and ground. And then we have a two-channel tape recorder here for you know recording out, record in. And then over here is the discrete input. So you have front and back for your left and front and back for your right channels. And then these are your speaker over here for front, back, for your left, front, back, for your right. And uh, I'm not going to bother demonstrating anything here for you know, like showing you the sound because since the turntable is broken, you can't really, you know, experience the four channel sound with anything else. If you put on the radio, it'll just kind of split it up however it wants to. And uh, before I turn it on to show you, I'll show you over here, here's the four speakers completely identical. But, I mean, you know, they have a pretty cool look to them. They're kind of small for, I guess, your audiophiles would probably want some big honking speakers in every corner of the room but I guess you know if you were top of the line had some space concerns or whatever you probably want something small like that now going over here to plug this guy in This cord is wrapped up very strangely. Alright. Alright, we got the power. Turn that on. And now, 
So you can see down here, let me adjust the camera a bit for that. There's a little dot. And now what you can do is, depending on where you are in the room, let's say I'm in dead center, you can bring it up and then bring it over and that'll adjust the sound for all the speakers so that I get the best sound quality depending on where I am in the room. But like let's say that I have a chair down over here, that'll work too. It'll give you a good sound there, it'll adjust the levels of everything else so that I get the best sound right there. And so that's the quadraphonic system. Um, I would show you a quadraphonic uh, LP, but I actually don't remember where it went. And it was just some sort of like little Christmas LP, it wasn't anything too cool. But uh, if I ever find that, and if I ever get the turntable working, I'll be sure to do a follow up segment. And uh, that's it. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you like this episode of Obsolete. Um, I got a few special thanks to give out there. Um, Finstack, of course, always for you know hosting the IRC channel, which uh, you can visit by the link below. Um, I'm usually in there all the time. There's usually five or six fans that are always in there. So if you're interested in anything in the episodes, any questions, there's always somebody there to talk to about it. Even if I'm not there, there's somebody in there who probably knows as much as I do, if not more, about the subject. And um, give a shout out to Vine Rev forums and. Uh, rant radio forums. I mean, I've, I've been posting updates on the episodes to those two forums, and I've always gotten positive reviews. And everybody there is really supporting, and I'm just really thankful for that. Um, I don't really have many other outlets that I can share this stuff to, so every little bit counts, and I'm really happy with how that's turned out. Um, also, Electronic Beer. Big fan of Electronic Beer, the podcast. They keep giving me shout-outs, and they have one every Wednesday, and I always feel bad because I do this monthly, so basically they give me four shout-outs for every one shout-out I give them, so big shout-out to Electronic Beer. Tune in Wednesday nights. Um, if you go to the website below, or if you even go to Thin Stack, you can probably find it fairly easily. It's a cool show. deals with you know current events, uh, techn technology, uh, and beer, of course, so, you know, good stuff there. And uh, that brings this episode to a close. I just want to thank everybody who watches it. Just by watching this, you're supporting the show. And uh, check out the website for new information. There's also now a Facebook group, well, a Facebook like, so you can like the show, put it in your t TV show section of your Facebook profile. Uh, as always, there's the Twitter account. And uh, new video just about every month. That might be coming to a slowdown soon, but I hope to do about eight episodes before I take a long break, because so I'm thinking an eight episode season is where I want to be. All right, and uh, that's the end of this episode. See you guys for the next one. MIT, I can I can feel their Ivy League intrigue all over this. All right, uh, grab that phone and hook it to the modem, okay? I don't care if they're running off of NORAD's main frame. By the time our killer weekend rolls around, I promise we'll be online to hack out little terminal entry.